I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. So good evening. Uh, so we're, on, we're almost done with Sock Club 1.0 and we're about to move to Sock Club 2.0. And we're recording tonight so that you can, you can uh, refer back to this later. And what I wanted to do first is review with you um, the changes that I've made to the page. Oh, it'd be good if I was on the page. So the page here has gotten a little bit of a facelift. And the first thing is when you go to the Sock Club info, it is now a cover page and underneath, so Sock Club info, I got to by clicking on the word Sock Club info under on the home page underneath our logo. It brought me to this page here. And at the top, there is a link to Sock Club 1.0, which is the every which way sock that we just completed or we are just completing. And then it has another link for the Sock Club 2.0 for the DRK everyday sock that's beginning next week. Then there's a description of Sock Club. And if this isn't enough, here it says Sock Club 1.0 notes and updates are posted here. The underlined word is its own link. Here's for Sock Club 2.0, that is its own link. I will continue to put an update on the home page, on the, the first page of Sock Club, so that you know what part has been updated. So the latest update, other than the fact that I split it all into pages, um, is that we added the fish lips kiss heel pattern. That is a link to Ravelry. The fish lips kiss heel pattern costs $1 on Ravelry. It is a very clearly explained document that shows you how to make these cardboard cutouts for yourself and all of your family members so that you can have feet wherever you go so that you don't have to try your socks on by taking off your own shoes or grabbing, as I do, the foot of my family member and shoving it into the, the sock that I'm working on. So um, I told you last time, I think that we were going to see if that was a free pattern or a for purchase pattern because Pam had shared it with me. And it is a for purchase pattern, but the cost is only $1. So it's kind of reasonable and she makes a good argument that she did lots of research and figuring out stuff and she'd like a dollar for it. So then underneath that is still the same information about Sock Club for new people who are interested. And if you talk to anybody who's interested in Sock Club, please remind them that they are always welcome, that you don't have to start on the first day. You can start whenever you want to. And uh, there won't be a grade at the end. You know, if you don't finish on the day or you finish early, you don't get an A or a D, you just get a sock. So it's kind of awesome. Um, I've added to this because of the cardboard requirement now. In addition to pencil and paper, you need cardboard that is sturdy and foot sized. It needs to be the size of the foot that you are measuring because it goes under the foot that you are measuring. So that's the only requirement of that cardboard. And then the rest of it stays the same. And then here I've changed, so that it went down and it was all the notes about the every which way sock that we had just finished. And now what it is, is all of our references. So for Sock Club 1.0, there's a link to the free pattern. There's a link to purchase the custom socks book if you want to from, from I think it's Amazon. And then there's a link to the how to knit socks on magic loop tutorial from the crazy sock lady a link for the long tail cast on, the German twisted cast on, my video of picking up gusset stitches that we recorded last week with the larger stitches, um, the, one of the original videos of the lifeline and toe decreases, and then the Kitchener stitch and grafting of the toe from when we did it originally. So those are all up on the home page. Also, Going forward for next week, we have the pattern for Andrea Mowry's Everyday DR, sorry, it's the DRK Everyday Sock. I've got to change that. It is toe up, it's a flegal heel. That pattern, if you don't have it already, is $7. 
And then also the pattern for the fish lips kiss heel pattern that is up above, but now it's here because when, when I update that, that'll go away. Um, so it's here, and this is the instruction for making the cardboard foot cut out. And then finally, I have already added the Turkish cast on with Andrea Mowry. That's how I learned to do it. If you're interested in trying it in the meantime, I'm not gonna stop ya. And then under that, I have other references and they include the Sock Knitters Handbook by Charlene Church, which we've talked about. Also a link to the video to, from that book when I discussed sock architecture. And then a new reference is the Knitter's Book of Socks by Clara Parks. And then I included Maddie's um, Kitchener Stitch links that she shared with us because they were very well thought out and extensive. So that's all on the very first page. On the Sock Club 1.0 page, it's all the notes and links as they appeared you know, before I changed it around. So it goes through all of the steps, it goes through the swatch, all of the links are still here, all the way down to step 12. So nothing's changed, it's just moved one page back because we aren't working on that sock anymore. And then I'm gonna go back to the sock club page and I'm gonna go over to the DRK everyday sock and all it has here is that we're casting on next week on March 15th at three and six. And here are the patterns and the video again. So I haven't started putting any notes on there yet. So that's what the Sock Club information pages looks like now. And I hope that is helpful for you all because that way, if you need something, you can find it. Obviously, if you have a question, please, feel free to call me or Pam or anybody um, and ask. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who may have joined a little bit later, Susie, we are recording. So from the beginning of my spiel, you will be able to go back and catch anything you missed. I figured that's the easiest way to keep everybody up to date. Um, okay, so what I, uh, just checking in. Um, I think most people have been okay with the, the videos of the demonstrations that we did. Um, so I was not, I was thinking that I wouldn't do another demonstration of the Kitchener stitch because we've done it once and I'm not gonna do it differently and it's recorded. So, so what I thought I would do instead is originally I talked about this much stuff about choosing sock yarns, half a page, not very densely written. And I thought, you know, I probably, I've had lots of questions. Um, lots of discussions have gone on now about choosing sock yarns. And I thought I should probably have a little bit more in depth of a, of a dive into that. So I used this book. This is the Knitter's Book of Socks. It's written by Clara Parks. Clara Parks is somebody well known in the sock knitting and the yarn world as a woman who has researched extensively from sheep to skein. In fact, I attended a lecture of hers at Vogue Knitting, sorry, Vogue Knitting, when we went down, when the, when the shop took a bus trip down there. One of the things I got to do was hear Clara Parks lecturing on From Sheep to Skein. And she has traveled around the world. Um, she's written several books about the properties of fibers used in knitting and how they're spun, how they're, how they're manufactured, um, the kinds of techniques that go into it. And she wrote an entire book on socks. So what she tried to do here is answer the question, what makes something a good sock yarn? And so I thought that's probably the one I should be reading from or taking notes from to answer your questions. So originally we said a tightly spun yarn and multiple plies and the itchiness factor had to do with if it was itchy on your elbow, not on your face. Does anybody remember us talking about that? And you know, if you're gonna have wool 
It could have up to 25% nylon. That silk adds strength and warmth and sheen and, and mohair adds strength and warmth and that you can test for wool sensitivity by wearing the yarn tied around your wrist or ankle for a day, which we thought was maybe the, um, I don't know, the boarding school way of, of testing for wool sensitivity. <laughs> and that the alternatives to wool are cotton, elastic, and bamboo blends or synthetic yarns. And, how much, and then we talked about how much yarn we needed. So I went back and I looked at that and I thought we really didn't talk about what makes a good sock yarn. And please feel free, even though we're recording, I'm, I'm not trying to lecture. I, this is a, as much a discussion as it can be. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to break in and ask. So I went through the book and, um, and she starts by saying the three most important factors for sock yarn are not tightness. <laughs> she didn't say that. She said elasticity. Uh -oh. <laughs> hold, hold, please. Hello, I'm recording a lesson on socks right now. Did you want to talk to me? Sorry. Back to work. Okay, so elasticity, which is the ability of a fiber to stretch beyond its original length and then stretch back. So it's not just the one way, it's both ways. You have to go out and back. So you want a yarn that works like a spring. And elasticity can be added to it through the fiber itself, through the stitch, sorry, the spin or the stitch. So there are ways of adding elasticity into a sock. Um, and it's measured by stretching a yarn and then letting it bounce back to its like until it will break. And the one thing that I thought was really interesting in the initial introduction to elasticity is that blending fibers doesn't always make them more elastic because if they have different levels of elasticity, one yarn can get stretched to the breaking point before the other yarn kind of kicks in. And so you can't just smush them together and say, okay, now we've got the perfect yarn. But what she does do is going forward, she, she will talk about like, you can use this inelastic fiber, but only in so much of a percent. So I think that's going to be very helpful. So the second, so first elasticity. The second component to a good yarn for socks is strength. And that's because unlike a shawl, it's under your foot. It's in your shoe. It's rubbing against the shoe. It's getting hot and sweaty and working all day long because you're standing and walking around on your sock. So abrasion is the term for the rubbing part of it. And tensile strength is the term for the bundled fibers ability to, to, to resist you know, the energy that's in it until it breaks. So the tensile strength is how much pounds of pressure the, um, the fiber can take before it breaks. And tenacity is, this, is an individual strands breaking strength, which I thought was an interesting use of the word tenacity. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a for instance, nylon has a, a tensile strength of 65,000 pounds per square inch versus wool at about 29,000 pounds per square inch at its strongest. So whatever nylon is, it's twice as strong as wool. And then cotton can range from 40 to 120,000 pounds per square inch, 40,000 to 120,000. So like twice as strong as nylon, it gets stronger when it gets wet. And we all know that because we've all tried to untie a pair of wet shoelaces. So we know how strong cotton is. So then the next one is absorb. The next word that's important is absorption. Absorption is the ability of the fiber to absorb moisture. She uses this as an opposite term for wicking. She says that wicking 
refers to a capillary kind of a process of removing moisture from one side of the surface to another. And that absorption is the ability of the fiber to absorb moisture, fluid, whatever. So it's measured as, as how much moisture now compared to if the yarn was bone dry, oven dry. So let's say your moisture content was right out of the oven, that would be 0% more moisture, but then how much could it hold at its wettest? Wool can hold 13 to 17% of its weight. And so it, that's the, re, re, again, a new word, regain. R-E-G-A-I-N is the moisture absorbing property of a fiber expressed as a percent of the moisture present in the fiber at any point versus if it were oven dry. So it can be 13 to 17% wet. And wool itself will not even feel wet until there's 30% of moisture in it. Like you can, you can have a woolen something on and if it's less than 30% absorbed uh, water, it won't even feel wet. It might feel heavy, but it won't feel wet. So wool is um, definitely the better absorbing fiber compared to cotton and nylon. But then she goes on later in the chapter to talk about cotton's wicking properties. And she just said here that cotton can't wick, that only synthetic fibers can wick. So now I'm confused. I don't know if cotton wicks or it doesn't wick. I'm not sure if it does. It does absorb and it can evaporate. But this is, so this is a big question mark for me. Um, so then it's a big question mark for you. And most, what she says initially about absorption and wicking is that wicking is the opposite of absorption. It's moving the moisture from one edge to the other, to the outer edge, and it uses capillary action and relies mainly on synthetic fibers like microfibers. So really, really, really super thin fibers. So then she says, a good sock yarn should be one that you want to work with by hand. So I think that's something we've all found is that we want to, to like it. We want to enjoy working with it. And it should have a comfortable texture to wear. So that's the elbow test. And it should wear well, it should be durable and it should be cushioning. And then she said something that I thought was really interesting and I wanted, I read it to the other group today and I wanted to read it to your group too, because she talks about the mystery. No, 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 the mystery of the yarn. And I thought it was such an interesting way to, um, so I'm gonna read the whole page because you're just gonna love it. It's so much fun, hang on. Happy socks have an unspoken fourth element. So we've talked about absorption and strength and elasticity, but happy socks have an unspoken fourth element, a simple and an obvious one. The yarn needs to be comfortable, pliable, and easily worked on knitting needles. It needs to be something we want to knit and wear. Cotton, for example, can make lovely socks if it's knit on machines at an extraordinarily fine gauge. Those machines work their magic by modifying stitches to add bounce and elasticity where there is none in the fiber itself. But when you increase the yarn to a thickness more appropriate for hand knitters, our ability to modify the stitches to create bounce and elasticity is diminished. And while you can knit socks out of any thickness of yarn, at a certain point, each stitch becomes so pronounced that it may irritate the foot when stepped on unless perhaps you're looking for this kind of self-massaging sock. For our purposes, a good sock yarn needs to be of a thickness and texture that we'd actually want to hold and work with. And yet it also needs to be something that will wear well. It needs to have sufficient bulk and loft to cushion our foot as we walk. And above all, it needs to be comfortable. And then she says, the finally, the real kicker. 
No matter how much we try to study the science of fibers, yarns, and fabrics, a little bit of mystery remains for which there is no rational scientific answer. Why can two skeins of the same yarn behave differently? We don't always know. We aren't at the farm when the thunder scared the sheep, causing them to develop a natural break, break in their fleece. Likewise, we aren't at the mill when the operator turned up the dial just a little so he could leave in time for his daughter's birthday party. And we weren't there at the Department of Public Works the day the operators changed their water treatment formula in such a way that the local hand dyer's blue became a little greener. There are things we simply cannot know. While we can try to learn as much as possible to mitigate the risks, which is my goal with this book, there will always be a small magical component of knitting that must remain a mystery. The sooner we surrender to it, the more we can let go and enjoy the adventure. So there you go. There's a little mystery. So whatever I say and whatever you think and whatever, like Liz was on earlier and she was talking about her group on Ravelry that knits 5,000 socks a year together, like as a group. And yeah, Maddie's falling over. And what she, you know, so that she said there are people on there who will argue for days about which sock yarn is the best. And the answer is that some sock yarns are better for some things. So, and there's still a little mystery. So that was the first part of that book. And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know if anybody has any questions about that part. I will go on. I'll go on? Okay. So here's some more terms that are used in, um, in fiber production that are helpful to know. Staple length. The staple length is the length of the unspun fiber before it is put into the yarn. Okay. So the shorter the staple or the longer the staple, it's twisted, it's spun into the yarn. Um, and you should know, you may be surprised that Merino and cashmere and Kivet and Yak and all sorts of, and Angora are very short staple. So they're very fine, very soft yarns, but they're very short staple. So they can all, they have to be tightly twisted or even, um, treated with oil to be able to be twisted enough to create yarn. Um, Longer staple, longer strands are more able to be secured when they're twisted. They have fewer ends. And so they create yarn that is much less vulnerable to breakage. The second thing that she talks about is the crimp or the natural waviness, like this kind of wavy of the yarn or curliness, actual curl of the yarn. And what she says is the more there are individual crimps in the yarn. So the smaller and more per inch that you'll see of the crimp, the more bouncy the yarn will be when it's spun. So you can sort of undo the, the undulating or ringlet kind of waves when you spin it, but you can't get rid of the little bounce. And so the finer and higher the crimp, the more it creates a lofty and bouncy and insulating yarn. And the less it will, it will be, so like it'll look like little pillows when it's twisted, for example. And you'll, like I've seen some yarns that look like beads on a string when they're plied together. And that's because they have that kind of crimp to them. Um, a good example might be Rambouillet yarn, if you've ever gotten to see that. But a lot of the time, what we're interested, what we think we're interested in are merinos and silks and things like that that have much smoother, much finer crimp and tend to be softer to the touch. Um, longer staples also pill less overall. So if you've ever, if you've ever had an Angora sweater or a sweater with some Angora, that is an excellent example of how short fibers pill because they are not well anchored in the yarn, they pull out and that's how they mat together to create the pills. Sometimes that happens with good cashmere 
And you'd think good cashmere, it shouldn't happen, but it's the kind of yarn that it is, it's, or the kind of fiber that it is to start with that creates the ability to pill. Um, silk, on the other hand, is an example of a fiber that has no crimp. So it doesn't have any surface texture at all. And so it's very fluid. It can be, it can be very dense and very, very drapey. And it also creates a very lustrous surface. There's nothing breaking up the surface. There's no waves breaking up the surface. There's no curls breaking up the surface. And as you all probably know, woolen and other animal fibers have scale. And the scales also break up the surface. And so silk and rayon, those kinds of fibers don't have anything that breaks up the light and they're very shiny and very lustrous and very smooth to the feel. So it doesn't hug or hold, but it does have a wonderful feel. And then the third thing that she talks about is the, the measurement of the diameter of the fiber itself. The individual strands of fiber are measured in a unit called a micron which is so many thousands of an inch, is it very small? It's um, the Greek letter mu is the, is the symbol for it. As an example, microfiber is one micron or less thick. Cashmere is 16 and merino is between 17 and 22 and other wools are more than 24. So the, the finer the fiber, the more it feels soft. If it's very, very thin, it's very, very soft. Think of baby hair versus grown up hair. <laughs> and that actually holds true. Baby wools, baby mohairs, baby cashmere, baby anybody are always smoother and less. So um, if you're ever looking for some something of fiber for somebody who has a sensitivity, the baby yarns, the natural fibers that are baby yarns are less susceptible for, less likely to cause sensitivities in people. So animal fibers are also known as protein fibers and they grow on animals and the kind of animals that we regularly see yarn from are sheep and goats. Mohair comes from goats, cashmere comes from goats. Camelids, which are llamas, alpacas, and vicuña, vicuñas and camels. And rabbits make angora yarn and muskox are where we get kivet and uh, bison. You can get the down from the front of a, of a bison. Um, and those are all the different kinds of animals that we can get fiber from. They tend to be, as a whole, fiber from animals is warm, absorbent, resilient, and elastic. And if it's spun with sufficient twist, can also be abrasion resistant. They have scales, which are microscopic overlapping structures on the surface. The downside of scales is that when protein strands absorb water, the scales go from lying down to standing up. They like swell out and they pop up and then you get them in the water and they stick together and they felt. So the process of felting is restricted to animal fibers that get super wet and then are agitated. They're helped by heat. That can help them swell up more, but uh, animal fibers that get super wet and get agitated. So the less scale or if they're treated to not stand up or to be not sticky to each other, and that's the process that we um, use to create superwash wools. So superwash wools are either bleached to heck so that they don't have scales anymore, or they're coated with a resin that, that keeps the scales from standing up so much, um, but keeps the other properties of the wool 
relatively intact, but wool that has been treated with superwash has different elasticity, particularly, and bounce than wool that is natural and has not been treated. So some of you may have seen the pictures of the sheep that came in from the cold, the Merino sheep named, I think he, what was, was he named Barack? who came in from the outback in Australia or New Zealand recently and he had 43 or 60 pounds of wool on him. So that's a sheep that has not been sheared and whose wool um, has no natural breaks in it. So he's been bred to not have natural breaks in his wool anymore. Some sheep do, like some sheep can remove their own fleece every year and do naturally remove their own fleece if, they're, if nobody shears them. Um, so wool can go from two inches to 12 inches left growing. It has fine crimp and the micron count can go from 17 to 31, just to give you a for instance. So it's quite a varied thing and breed specific yarns have become much more of a trend and you will be able to go eventually, please Lord, you'll be able to go to fiber festivals again, and you'll be able to find Corydale yarn and Blue-Faced Lester yarn and sheep from Outer Kalamazoo yarn and sheep named Jacob yarn. And you can, you can buy yarn from specific sheep even. So um, yarn will be very, very much, wool will be variable depending on the breed and the sheep itself. Um, alpaca will also vary depending on the, the breed and the actual animal, but it tends to be warm and dense and it tends to have much smoother scale. So it doesn't, it, it will felt, it doesn't felt as easily. It takes more effort to felt al alpaca and it tends to create a very smooth, like, drapey smooth fabric. So it benefits for socks because it's not very bouncy to have some wool added to it. Um, and you can add quite a bit of wool. It could be like 50-50 or 90-10 or 2-90, you know, whatever. Um, mohair is naturally strengthening and very shiny, but again, it's not very bouncy. It is what they call the natural nylon. So Clara recommends between 10 and 20% mohair if that's what you want to blend with. You shouldn't blend more than that. Um, we talked about yarns from baby animals being finer and helping helpful for people with sensitivities. Angora fibers are the kind of thing that it's, it's good to just add a little sprinkle of if you want it. They're not durable. They won't hold up. Neither will down from the, the the chest of the muskox or the kivet or the bison. So down fibers like that, cashmere, angora, kivet, all of those, yak, oh yak, I forgot to say yak. Um, all of those are very, very short, fine fibers and a little bit of them will create halo in your yarn. It will, so I think Christine is knitting with Squishy, which has 10% cashmere. What that's going to do is create this sort of the word halo is perfect, but it's like a glow of fuzzy fibers around the strand of yarn so that the definition of stitch, like if we were doing fine stitch work, the definition of that will be somewhat obscured by the, by the fuzz. Um, it's great though to add a little bit of that because it does create softness. The halo is on the surface. It does create a feeling of softness when you touch it and it's very insulating. So it, it does have a nice property for like somebody who has cold feet, cashmere in their socks will be helpful. Oh, said I was, I was signed out, okay. How are we doing? We got some time. So silk is a hybrid between plant and protein. Silk is digested cellulose. So the little silkworms eat the mulberry leaves and then they extrude out 
the strand of, of silk, that's the word, um, it can be up to 800 yards long, a single strand. I know, it's ridiculous. It is lustrous, warm, absorbent, and strong, but it has no bounce, it has no scale, it has nothing on the surface. There's no, there's no ripples. Um, so she recommends adding 10 to 20%. It adds luster and warmth and um, no bounce. So no more than 10 to 20%. Cotton is a seed fiber. Think of like milkweed. So cotton is the same kind of thing. It has no scales, but it does have some surface contortions that function like a scale. And it's also an excellent absorbing fiber. It absorbs very, very well. It can be blended up to 50% with wool for socks. And you could add up to about 5% of elastic or spandex to it if wool is out of the question. And I think um, several of you are using bamboo pop sock. And some of you have maybe used the Regia cotton. And those are examples of plant fiber or uh, cellulose fiber that have. Um, elastic with them so that they have enough bounce to be good sock yarns. So even though the, we've sold those and we've and, and I'm sitting here saying cotton is a terrible yarn for socks, it's not if it's if it's mixed with something that has bounce like elastic in it. And so both of those yarns do. Um, I was very curious to, to hear that mercerization, which is the process that makes cotton shiny and soft, actually decreases its use in socks. So unless you mercerize it and then add elastic, you shouldn't use mercerized cotton because it's less, it's even less elastic than normal cotton and it's usually denser. Um, I don't know if you've all heard the term BAST, B-A-S-T. BAST fibers are stem fibers. So cotton and milkweed and things like that, that's the fiber around the seed. But a bast fiber is like the stem of the flax plant is what makes linen, or the stem of uh, bamboo, which is a grass, which makes bamboo fiber. Now, unfortunately, I was of the opinion that bamboo was a great environmentally friendly fiber, and I've learned otherwise today because the, the process of making the fiber from it, the regenerated cellulose fibers, you have to chemically digest. It's sort of like if the silkworm were a process, what would we do? The silkworm eats the and digests it in the stomach acid and then spins it out. But if we do it, we have to chemically digest and dissolve the fiber, the cellulose, and then we extrude it into an acid bath to create the strand of fiber. So the fiber has no crimp or surface texture, so it's lustrous and absorbent and warm, and it's stronger than wool but weaker than silk, and it has less elasticity than cotton. It should be used in blends of 10 to 20 percent with fibers that have more elasticity, and of all of the regenerated cellulose ones, the most eco-friendly is not bamboo but is tencel which recovers and recycles up to 99% of the solvents used in its spinning. So there's a recycling of, of the materials with the production of Tencel. The production of most bamboo is happening in China. So her book was written in 2011. It is entirely possible there, have been, there has been forward movement in ecological practices in China. I know that there is a great deal more recycling happening now than ever had been, but I don't know how it applies to the bamboo production. Um, and finally, synthetic fibers are all derived from coal originally. They're, um, they're, they usually come from resins that are created from coal and they have no moisture absorption, but they can be warm, they can be durable, and they are certainly inexpensive. The straight filaments can be set with steam to make it crimp. So that's why you can have acrylics that look like wool because they've been given a crimp. I know, and that it's kind of fascinating. So you can make it the same thickness and the same crimp. And so then it acts like wool. But 
They, and they can also be machine washed and dried. Nylon has similar elasticity and extensibility and we frequently blend it with wool so that wool can be spun even finer. Um, polyester and acrylic are less durable and are typically prone to pilling, but there are now strategies and mechanisms in place to create anti-pilling acrylic and we have some of them in the shop. So they feel woolier than nylon does. Nylon doesn't usually feel wooly. And then Lycra is a synthetic elastic. And if you use that, you don't need very much. You can use one to 5% of that kind of elastic to add to cotton or bamboo. I hope you guys are fascinated. <laughs> I'm not putting you to sleep. So then the last part of this that I wanna talk about is the twist. And um, we got into a little bit of a discussion of twist in the earlier class, but I did not read ahead and I did not finish my reading before the earlier class happened because I'm gonna blame Pam. Pam kept calling me. I couldn't finish my reading. <laughs> so twist is based though, so, how, so twist is obvious. It's the twist of the yarn, right? It's based on the staple length. And this is where I kind of lost it because it was like the shorter, the staple, the more it has to be twisted. And it make, that makes sense. But like in my head, I was like, no, 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 no. The longer the staple, the more, it, no. It's the shorter the staple, the more twists per inch because otherwise it won't stay stable in the fiber. Okay. So when it's, and when it is tightly, wound or tightly spun, it creates greater firmness, but less pliability. And also the tighter you do it, the more it has a tendency to skew because there's energy in the twist. This goes into physics. We're not all good at physics. I don't know if there's somebody here who's better at it than I am, but the more energy in the twist, the more that energy can be released once you're knitting. And so if you've ever worked with, um, and this has nothing to do with sock yarn, but if you've ever worked with, um, not velour, do I mean velour? Chenille yarn, chenille yarn, however it's made, whatever happens to it in its, in its making, it's fine when you first get it, but then you knit it into something and then it comes out and it worms in your sweater and you'll get these like pulls of yarn that tw twist on themselves like an old telephone cord. And it has to do, it's, that's exactly what they're talking about. Like if you over twist something, then it will twist back on it. If it has any slack at all, it will go and twist back on itself. So that's the energy in the yarn. So the tighter the twist, the more energy, the looser the twist, the greater the softness, the tighter the twist, the less the pliability, the looser the twist, the less the durability. Woolen spun is something that I just know from her from other lectures. And I think when we had the, I can't think of her name right now, but the lady who came and talked to us about spinning, I wanna say her name is Liz, so I should know her name. Um, woolen spun has to do with combing the fibers first and then twisting them. No, backwards, I take it back. Woolen spun is you take some fiber and you just start spinning it. And so there can be pockets of air and it creates very light and very airy fabric that breaks easily. An example of woolen spun yarn in the shop is Remix. If you, if you pull Remix, it will break apart. So it doesn't have long fibers. It's just like little clumps of things that have been twisted together. Um, worsted spun involves combing the fibers so that they're all going in the same direction, removing any irregular lengths of fiber so that the longest strands are together and then spinning it. So worsted spun is better for socks makes sense. So then the different, there's different numbers of plies that you can have. A single ply yarn 
We don't have a single ply that we would sell for socks. The single ply that we have in the store is Machita from Malabrigo. The single, let's see, Erie Singles from Superfine and Haverland's, I think it's Chesapeake, is the single. We use that for shawls and sweaters and all sorts of other things, but we do not recommend it for socks. The reason is that you have to add up to 30% nylon to make it strong enough. It's just literally strands of individual wool that are barely twisted together. Um, if it is twisted enough to be used, it can cause the fabric to actually start to corkscrew or bias when you knit with it. And what Clara says is if you fall in love with a sock, so it was a yarn like Machita and you wanna knit with it for socks, make leg warmers. <laughs> because they don't go under the foot. It's the durability that's the issue. So if you really want to make something that goes on a foot that is sock-like, do a leg warmer or a boot topper, which is essentially the same thing, that you can tuck into the top of your boot and it can, it can fold over the top or show up on your leg outside of the boot, but it has no possible chance of getting under your foot. Um, when you ply two yarns together, and you can ply them in different ways. And I'm not gonna talk about the different, all the different ways, but when you ply them together, that's when you create the sort of beads on a string look. And you're essentially saying, you know, here are two strands of fiber that I'm twisting together. I'm giving you energy. They have a lot of bounce and a lot of energy. So she very much likes plied fibers and starting with the two plies, she said that the two plies create tiny shadows in the knitting stitches and they can either be tightly or loosely plied. If they're loosely plied, you might wanna use um, a little bit more reinforcement when you're making things like the heels or the bottom of the foot. And you know how we did the slip, si slip stitch heel and we used one strand and we slipped it every other stitch in, um, she was talking about some tricks that, oh, the wine fairy's coming. <laughs> but in the bottom of a, of a foot, another trick that you could use if that's where you wear your socks out the fastest is you could knit with two strands. Remember we said you could knit with two strands but do it at a tighter gauge. She suggested using two strands of yarn and alternating each strand as you go. So same two colors and you knit strand A, strand B, strand A, strand, and so they're, they're like woven in together. So it's not double stranded, but one of them is being stranded behind the other one when you knit with the other one. Did I say that clearly? If you knit with strand A, you're stranding B, and then you knit with strand B and you're stranding A. So it's like, it's like hopscotch or leapfrog or leapfrog. I'm gonna say leapfrog. We're gonna go with leapfrog. Um, but tightly twisted two ply yarn can be very strong and springy and it shows to advantage in stitch patterns that use knits and pearls like our garter stitch or in lace. So I thought that was kind of interesting. She said the perfect ply number is three. Well, she didn't say that. She said that three plies nest together and that anything more than that and the extra strands will will wrap around the outside. So if you look at a four ply, you will see that there's one strand that's sort of wrapped around because the three plies will nest together kind of like a three legged stool. They just they all support each other. So she thought that three plies created good transitions for color work. They had smooth stitch definition and created very high relief for cables and ribbing. So three ply seems to be the winner here but they don't always tell you. So you'd have to actually examine the ends of the yarn or take a little bit of the yarn and you know, untwist it to be able to count the plies. If you do that, you can, you can pretty much untwist it enough to see how many plies are present. This is two ply. Okay, four or more plies, like I said, the extra strand will wind around the outside 
Um, and then she talked about three different kinds of spinning techniques or plying techniques. And one has to do with twisting the, so the spin of the original strands and the spin of all of those strands together are all in the same direction. I believe I'm understanding. So Maddie's gonna correct me if I'm wrong, is that's S on S cables. So you're taking the strands and you're spinning them counterclockwise and then you're spinning all of those strands together counterclockwise. That creates um, an interesting dynamic though. These, this is what's called crepe yarns. If you've ever heard a yarn referred to as a crepe yarn, they're all being spun the same way. So there's nothing counteracting this, the twist. And so when you knit with these, the left leg of your knit stitch will appear as a vertical line. Instead of being like this, the left leg will sit up and it has to do with the twist and the way that we knit. <laughs> so I found that absolutely fascinating. A true cable, you ply the yarn one way and then you twist it together in the opposite direction. So like the yarn is spun clockwise, but then it gets twisted counterclockwise. The individual strands are spun clockwise and then they're spun together counterclockwise. Those are very stable and it will not have a weird looking left leg. So the deeper I dive into this stuff, the more I think I don't wanna know. <laughs> And the last one is core spun. And this is for all you bamboo pop sock lovers out there. Core spun have the ply, the center ply is elastic. So whatever that unpronounceable word is in the ingredients of the universal bamboo pop sock, that's the one to 5% elastic. That's the center core of bamboo pop sock. And then, the inelastic fiber, in that case, bamboo and cotton, are spun almost perpendicularly around. So they have so much that they can stretch and they're around a piece of elastic. So that's why it works as a sock yarn because they're being spun. They're not like, they're, they're just being sort of laid around the center. And that's why they can be a little bit fuzzy to work with if you've tried it. That's why the universal pop sock and also the Regia, the Regia um, bleh, cotton yarn are the same kind of thing. And that actually was the end of my talk. So Maddie just about hit it. So I know you're all silenced, but you can turn off your mutes if you want to and ask any questions you want. I have a question. Um, I mean, what you were talking about was very interesting, but I have a question about the swatch for this new sock. Mm -hmm. Since um, I started my swatch. Good job. But I did like 40 stitches and I'm do doing the two by two ribbing. Mm -hmm. And how should I go 44 rounds to see if I get that not rounds, but 44 rows to see if I get that length or how big do you, th we did three inches on the other one. Yeah. So I think maybe three inches would be a good amount because you want to go far enough so that you've really um, settled into the okay. knitting of it that you're not. And, and when you lay it out flat, do you stretch the, the, um, the ribbing so it's flat. I, I would not stretch it, but I would want to. I would want to see that it's stretchy. I believe. Let me just check the the, the gauge. The gauge is in our, in our four point five stitches. Hang on one second, sweetie. Chandra, you're using the pop yarn, aren't you? Yes. Do you like it? So far, I do. Okay. Let me just look at the gauge. Very soft. Okay, so she says 34.25 stitches and 44 rounds equals four inches, 
measured over the ribbing after blocking. She does not say stretched. Okay, because um, I'm on a size one. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, it, I, I have to cut my threads obviously, but this is 40 inch, 40 stitches. And that's not at all, it doesn't look at all like it's gonna be anywhere close to four, four um, you know, to get the four inch width. Well, you know what I would do is maybe move down a needle size before you're finished mm -hmm. and put in a, um, a line of plain knitting so that you can see where you do it. So that when you block it, you can see the difference between your original. Go down or go up? Because well, we have to go up to make it bigger. Oh, sorry, go up. Go <laughs> up, sorry. Go up a needle size to make it bigger. You know, these old hands just aren't gonna do too much smaller than a size one. <laughs> There's not a lot of difference between a one and a smaller size. They're all, they're all about the same when you get that small, but okay. they're the difference that they do in the, in the amount of space between the needles is different between the stitches is different. Okay. So I know all the words. I haven't had a sip of the wine yet. I just want to say, so, um, go, so make a line of knit stitches or purl stitches so you can see where you're switching. Okay. and go up a needle size and see if that makes you feel better. And remember that you have to block it to be really sure. Because right. cotton will do right. different things when it's wet. Okay, okay. But So the other thing is you're using a yarn that has elastic in the center of it. 8%. And it's so called You may need to be on a bigger needle because oh, okay. when you when you wrap it, you're stretching the elastic, and when it when it settles, it it shrinks. So you may want to go up a needle size. Now that I'm thinking about it, you want to go. You will want to go up a needle size. Okay. Go so go I up. Could just, I could just stop here. This is about an inch and a half. Yeah. Almost so you could change now, and then let's see if you can get better gauge on the next needle size up. Okay, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Is there anybody else using bamboo pop sock? Uh, Natalie is. Natalie is, yeah. Do you, that's it. So if you're not getting gauge in the ribbing, because ribbing pulls in, you may want to go up a needle size. You may be so happy, Susie. No, no, no. I'm still on sock number one and sock number one of one. <clears throat> so. Whatever. Whatever. Can I ask you fine. Yay. 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 <laughs> I'll, I'll be there soon enough. I have a question though. Uh, should I, you want me to ask you now or tomorrow during question time? Now it's fine. Even though we're recording, how embarrassing. Okay. Okay. So, I can stop. You don't want everybody to know the answer to the question? It doesn't matter. Well, actually, it could be interesting. Could be interesting. I'm, left, I'm, I'm left handed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I am too. Uh, Step, uh, step nine, picking up the stitches along the heel flap. Mm -hmm. so just finish the heel flap. Okay. And it says that your working yarn is supposed to be on the left-hand side. Correct. It is for me. It is. But I'm left-handed. That's fine. Okay. So now a deck, I'm left-handed too. So now you and pick up the stitches on the side where the yarn is. Okay, I'll have to watch your video. So turn, so you turn it so the right side is facing you, which is Correct. the bumpy side of the heel, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you've got the working yarn and you're just gonna pick up stitches using the right needle mm -hmm. and the working yarn. And you're picking up stitches in that fabric where your slip stitches are. Mm -hmm. I'll have to watch the video first because I, I'm not You're hold, you hold the, the, the needle and the yarn in your right hand, correct? Mm -hmm. I hold the needle and, and the yarn in my left hand. So what it would look like right now, if I were to knit one more row, uh huh, 
I have the inside of the sock looking at me. So the, the knitted part of the heel flap, it would be, that's where I would go next. I would have the needle in my, my, all the stitches on my left hand and I would work with my right needle. So it's like you're continuing a row. Mm. You're continuing in the same direction that you just knit. So you don't turn it. Oh, oh. And the working yarn is on the left side. That's the difference. The working yarn's on the right side, but I can knit one row, more row. And no, 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 no. You, you pick up, so you, when you work in that direction, what direction are you working from and to? If I work where the bumpy side of the heel flap is facing towards me, mm -hmm. I would be working towards the right. So my needle would be in my left hand. You knit onto the needle in your left hand. In the left hand, correct. Okay, so you, so how did you, so you got to that point, knitting onto the needle in your left hand. Mm -hmm. So then keep it turned in the same direction mm -hmm. so that the right side of the work is facing you. And then you're going to use the needle in your left hand. Mm -hmm. No, no, the needle, you're working onto the needle in your left hand. Correct. No, I mean, that's, let's see. No, that's not the way I usually knit. How do you nor normally knit? You're, okay, so I'm on the last row of the heel flap. So did you, so, turn, did you turn it around to show me? Yes. So put it back, the, put it back like you've just finished that work. Okay. Put it back in your hands like the inside is facing me and the outside is facing you but That's what, where I ended. okay so let's say you were going to knit another row what would you do i would be knitting it let me see if you were knitting another row let's see can you see it you just put your right needle into that and she's knitting onto the you're okay. knitting from the left needle to the right needle correct you're right okay so you knit exactly like I do. Okay. You just have a dominant hand. Correct. Your direction is exactly the same. So right. you can follow the directions on the video exactly the same. Okay. We'll do so it. when you turn it around, the thing that you're seeing, so for example, I'm just gonna hold up my knitting. My working yarn is here, mm -hmm. right? It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see you. Right. So what's going to happen is you're going to pick up stitches from where this needle is along the side. Oh. And so what you have to do is pull the needle out so you can do that. Okay. And then it'll, it'll have a 90 degree turn. And that's what the video shows you. Okay. And you do it from the right side of the fabric, pushing the needle in from the right side to the inside or the wrong side of the fabric wrapping on the wrong side and pulling that stitch out. I think I got it, but we'll see. Yeah, you'll be able to do it. I'm, I'm absolutely confident you can do it. Matt, I'll see you tomorrow. And anyway, Matt, thank you. It's, it, yeah, whatever. But you, I mean, it's, it's so hard because people are taught that knitting left-handed means that you're doing it differently. And the reality is that you're dominant. In other words, you're more comfortable with the things you do with your left hand compared to people right. who are right-handed, but we all typically knit the same way. Got it. Okay. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're, and you may find it's easier to, to hold your, your yarn in the left hand versus the right hand. All of that is fine. All of that applies to all knitters, but only a few knitters actually knit in the reverse direction. And I've only actually met one in the 30 years that I've been knitting and the 20 years I've been teaching. So, so I would be, I'd be like, Ooh, Susie, you're one of, you're another one. <laughs> no, I'm just normal Susie. <laughs> I may see you tomorrow for more questions, but I'll work on it tonight. No problem. That sounds great. <laughs> see everybody. It's always a pleasure to spend an hour with everybody. It is yeah. good to see you good too. everyone. Good and to Karen, see you. Karen is well. going to be working on quilting, but she's going to be back next week. So thank you, Karen. Thank you, Anna.
Good night. Have a great week, everybody. You too. Stay Bye. well. Bye-bye. You too. Bye.